Hello again, I am Blunty, forcing the enthusiasm today because I feel like shite, and I felt like shite the entire weekend, and for those of you who like to come along to the streams, that's that's why I've been incommunicado the entire weekend. Didn't even tweet, I don't think. Just sat around feeling miserable. So send me some good vibes and join me today on this weekly show I have been referring to up until now as Blunty's more than tweet-worthy nerd news, which is too long. It's just too long. And people have suggested I find a shorter name and put it in the title because they don't normally, you know, they, they might not click on you know, the, the clickbaity headline I choose out of one of the stories to make these things about. So now I'm just going to call it Blunty's Bits because you see, I'm, I'm Blunty and these are little bits of nerd news. And also it's a innuendo. Wait, that's not how you say it. Na, 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 na. It's going to be a bit of a sciencey themed show today. Many of the things I want to talk about are sciencey and space science in particular, a couple of them. Uh, NASA are working on an aluminium balloon sent to Venus uh, to study the climate there, because Venus is very similar to Earth in many ways. It's about the same size, about the same gravity, about the same composition and everything, uh, except it's kind of had a catastrophic runaway greenhouse effect and the atmosphere is like a hundred times thicker and more dense and filled with nasty stuff that just traps the heat in there and and therefore the surface of venus is incredibly hot and actually is hot enough to melt lead so we can't really send little robots to crawl around on the surface and rovers and stuff because without sort of sophisticated refrigeration and things like that which is complex and expensive and prone to failure and things like that just kind of melt so instead, NASA are making an aluminium balloon. Well, except it's NASA, which is the American Space Agency. So, of course, we should pronounce it how they would pronounce it there, which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the story in the first place. It's an aluminium balloon. Isn't it fun to say? It's an aluminium balloon, not an aluminium balloon. It's an aluminium balloon. And that just makes me smile. And as I said in the opening, I haven't smiled much over the past few days. I've been feeling very bad. So just, just having the opportunity to say aluminum balloon makes me smile. And I hope it makes you smile too. But it's interesting in the fact that it is <laughs> a big aluminum balloon. Uh, and the point is to have it high up in the atmosphere where it's cooler. And so they can just hang scientific instruments off the bottom of it, I suppose, and walk down and see what's going on. So they can study uh, the climate there on Venus for much, much, much more uh, extended periods of time. And that's cool. I think it's cool anyway. Even if, they, even if it wasn't an aluminum balloon, even if they made the balloon out of some other metal that doesn't rhyme with balloon, I would still be happy about it because science is fun. Na, 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 na. A bit closer to home and in somewhat related news, another robot we've sent to another planetary body, in this case the moon, and in this case China's lunar rover over on the dark side. Eh, turns out they found some goo on the moon. Moon goo. Something gel-like. So the rover is just, you know, crawling around, doing its thing, roving on the moon, doing science and stuff, looking at stuff with its fancy cameras. And there was a, a gel-like stuff. And that's not what we expect to see on the moon. You think about the moon from a layman's point of view, and you think just, it's all regolith. It's just gray dust, sharp gray dust. Of course, all the dust on the moon is very sharp. If you didn't know that, I learned this from Mythbusters. Or they call it reg moon regolith because it's all pointy and sharp because the rocks get smashed up when asteroids and crap hit it. But there's no weather on the moon to make it all smooth you don't, you don't just you, it's not sand it's, it's not smooth sand i mean it, it's it's sharp and tiny little the moon is filled with tiny knives i just thought it was cool because you know you don't you don't really think about finding gel-like substances moon goo it's not entirely true of course back in the early 70s when we landed people there uh some of the blokes were kind of excited about this orange dust soil they called it, it wasn't really soil but they figured it. They figured out it was just it was caused by an asteroid impact. And the point is, the moon is not all grey and boring. It's filled with knives, orange soil, and now moon goo. Na 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 na. Now, if you're a bit of a weeb, like many of us are, I suspect, even if you hide it from yourself, why wouldn't you love Japanese culture? There are so many fantastic things uh, that they do that we don't, or at least when we try it, it winds up being weird and awkward. In Japan, it's just like accepted. One of the things uh, is, of course, themed cafes. Uh, in particular in and around sort of Tokyo and stuff, many, many themed cafes, often uh, themed around pop culture stuff, like there's a Sailor Moon cafe and a Gundam cafe and things like that. And there's a, there's a cafe you can go to where it's just filled with cats, gentle, loving little cats. So you can just sit down, have a piece of cake and a cup of tea and pet a cat. And nothing sounds more delightful to me right now 
than just doing that, except for the fact that I would have to go out and amongst people. I could have a cat cafe that comes to me. <gasps> Million dollar idea. Nobody steal it. Or actually, no, steal it so you do the work and then I can just use an app and go send cat and cake and tea, bloop, and like Uber Eats, is just, it just arrives. But there's another cafe in Japan that's just opened up that I found particularly fascinating. Uh, it's, it's a 2D cafe. Everything's been painted sort of flat white with these sort of uh, slightly uneven black outlines around everything, make to look like a 2D monochrome illustration. And the, 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 the photographer and videographer in me just went nuts about this because just finding that right angle to make it just make the illusion look really cool and just have the colorful plate of food. Uh, you know, uh, just, it, it, it fascinates me being, uh, the, I want to go there while it's empty and just take a bunch of food photographs and just become one of those food Instagrammers. They just post pictures of food. Can't stop saying the word food. I should have had breakfast before I started. Na, 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 na. We could soon be seeing practical and useful 3D display technology. We've had 3D displays for decades. There's been numerous ways to do it. I remember even way back on the, the Sega Master System, going all the way back there, that had, that had some 3D shutter glasses you would plug into the front, put the things on, and it would flicker your TV screen and flicker LCD shutters on your glasses to get you a 3D effect. Then, of course, you know, go all the way back to the 50s and the red-green stuff, and the latest sort of 3D technology in cinemas where it's uh, polarized glasses and the 3D TVs, which never really called on for whatever reason, not enough content or it's too awkward to use in the glasses. You have to recharge the active glasses and the passive glasses, which worked well. One company had the pattern on and, and didn't really spread it around. It never really called on. But now a company called Lightfield Technology has just secured major funding to really plow into this and make sort of holographic displays using light field technology. I've played with light field stuff briefly before in the form of a Lytro camera, the ill fated Lytro camera. Very expensive, not particularly good resolution, but really, really interesting in the way it worked. It captured the light field so you could focus afterwards and do all kinds of fun sort of 3D kind of tricks and things like that. It, it never really caught on. It was difficult to share uh, online and things like that, but eh, it was interesting for the fact it was interesting. It was, it was step one in what could be a really interesting future in cameras if, if this sort of continues on, and if that stays in step with this light field screen technology, this holographic screen, this, this holodeck type display technology. But the most interesting thing about this is it does it without the need of any special glasses or anything. It's just, it uses science. I was, I was, gonna, I was, I was about to say magic, but that would, it, it devalues it. It's clever science and clever technology and very clever engineering. So are we just a fistful of years away from just buying a light field monitor, putting on the desk and just getting, seeing, seeing, seeing right through it, seeing into the world through it. I hope so. Because it's, it's, it, I mean, that's a level of, and particularly for gaming, it's a level of immersion I'm excited about. I mean, you can already get that sort of immersion stuff even more so with VR headsets. But again, you got the headset and the sensors and the hand ones and you can put it on, it's, it's a dedication of time and effort. Uh, if it's just on the screen in front of you, no time and effort. There, there, there's no, there's no friction point there. You just use it like a regular screen. You sit down, you see 3D stuff. Wouldn't that excite you? Excites me. Na, 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 na. And in gear and or technology and or stuff I want and or need, Sony have just taken the wraps off their latest APS-C uh, Alpha Series cameras. Do they, oh wait, do they still call them the Alpha Series or just call the A Series these days? I don't think they'll use Alpha in the marketing anymore, do they? Anyway. The A6600. The interesting things about the A6600, the new flagship in that kind of section of their cameras, uh, is they brought in all the cool technology they've been bringing up from the high-end stuff, like all the really uh, fancy intelligent focus stuff, which apparently by reports works really, really well. I actually haven't tried it. Uh, I haven't tried since they brought in the new focus series stuff, but it tracks your eye, tracks your face, then tracks your body, and you know tracks whatever is most convenient at the time. And apparently it works really, really well, and it's been very popular by uh, run and gun shooters for that very reason. Uh, I use a GH5 to shoot a lot of my stuff. Well, this is a GH7 set up on the monitor here, but the GH5 went out and about or at the table and stuff. And the focus on that is not good. It's well known for being not very good at all, but the quality of that camera is, oh. But the response to the A6600 has been a bit mixed. I mean, for me personally, we still don't have a flip out screen. I'm a one man band. I need a screen that flips out to the side. I mean, you can get an adult monitor and things like that, but that's another thing. You have to bolt to the camera and another cable and another battery. And that's another thing they've improved with this camera, by the way, the battery it's doubled the battery life, which is, is, is another thing that's kept me away from Sony's cameras because the battery life on those things is bad, especially compared to my GH5, which I can shoot all day long in an event 
on like a, a battery and a half. Like I go to PAX or something, I have to change the battery once, maybe. But there is no denying that Sony's focus technology is very, very smart. Their image quality is beautiful. Uh, the cameras are lovely to use and hold and things like that. And the lenses that are coming out for the uh, A-series cameras are very enticing. And I would definitely like one to, to play with. I can't afford or justify buying one right now because I have cameras and lenses that do the job I need them to do. But that doesn't stop me wanting one. So if, if Sony knocked on my door and did, 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 hey, hey, it's been a while since you've read one of our cameras. Why don't you, why don't you have to play with this? Okay, yeah. But the, 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 there's one thing that's kind of turns me off the A6600. And it's one of the things that's turned me off most of the Sony cameras in this range, whether it be the APS-C or the full frame runs, and that is the rolling shutter. It's just horrible. And again, I, when I shoot handheld, and I shoot handheld quite a lot, that rolling shutter is a big thing. It just when you move the camera, everything goes... And that's just not a problem with the GH5, uh, partly because the sensor readout is nice and quick, partly because the sensor is physically smaller as well. That's one of the good things about the Micro Four Third system as opposed to the uh, APS-C or full frame cameras, that rolling shutter is basically nuked to hell. But yeah, because in the A6600 they're using the same sensor, uh, I, you, I've already seen that the rolling shutter on that thing is just... <laughs> but again, if I ever get the opportunity to have one in hand and play with it, I'll give it a go on its own merits, but yeah. But that is your lot for this week in Blunty's Bits. I hope you enjoyed Blunty's Bits. I hope you find Blunty's Bits entirely satisfactory, if not completely pleasant. There are better jokes to be made here, but I do feel catastrophically awful. And I'm out. I'm out of the ability to mask it at the moment. I've, I've, run, I've burned through every ounce of enthusiasm and presence that I have for today. So I'm just going to turn off all the lights, sit in the dark, and feel gloomy again. I'm going to do it now. Actually, I should have recorded the video like this. It's much easier in my eyes. Doesn't look too bad, does it? Just lit by the monitors.